welcome all that could make it. Let's turn to Matthew 28, please. The Lord has had on my heart for a number of weeks now to, to, to preach the Great Commission. And uh, the blessed thing of reviewing the, the Great Commission, the command that he gave the preachers to go out and preach the Gospels, that none of these points are foreign to us here at Grace Bible Church. These are fundamental, routine, common doctrines that we preach and teach week in, week out. All power is given unto Christ. Teach all nations, not just the Jews. Baptism, what it is, observing all things, that Christ is all righteousness. And then, lo, Christ is with you always. These things are in almost every message. I just thank the Lord for that. I thank, I thank the Lord, too, that um, this message is going to be tilted towards convincing you that you're just full of sin. Uh, the, other, the false preachers of the world are going to take this passage and try to convince you that you have some characteristic or ability in yourself and that you're a pretty good person try to convince you to look to yourself, try to convince you that you're not so bad after all, that you got to get up and do something. And by God's grace, I'll never say that to you. It's the direct opposite message, and it leads in. The verse right before the Great Commission shows that that's where God's pastors are leveled, that we're all sinners, especially the pastor. So let's read Matthew 28. This is Christ's return after uh, his death burial. This is his resurrection. Chapter 28 of Matthew reads this way. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to draw towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. This is where Christ was buried. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon that, that rock. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, remember the, the religious people today put people to guard that tomb because they didn't want them to steal the Lord Christ's body and, and try to fake a resurrection. So they had guards there. And for the fear of them, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. And he's not here, for he's risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly and from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. Now, this is their first glimpse at Christ after they three days prior, they saw him tortured on that cross. They saw the earth darkened for those three hours when the wrath of God the Father was upon Christ. They saw him yield up the ghost and say, it's finished. Then they saw him take his body down and put him in this, in this grave. And here they are now, and he's alive right in front of them. It says, all hell. And they came and held him by the feet. What a, what a glorious moment to see your resurrected Savior alive and well and just hold him by his feet, worship him and hold him by his feet. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid and go tell my brethren that they, are, and that they should go into Galilee and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the, the which came into the city and showed unto the chief priests and all the things that were done. So the, the chief priests had people that were part of them that noticed the resurrected Christ and these two worshiping him at his feet. And when they were assembled with the elders, they had taken counsel. They gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. So they saw the resurrected Messiah through their spies, and they still wanted to stick with their original deception story that, that the, they came and took, stole the body of Christ instead of he's resurrected. He's resurrected. He's resurrected. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and, and secure you. We'll protect you. For they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported even among the Jews right now in this day and generation. The Jews don't believe in the resurrected Messiah. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. 
And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, Here's the great commission, All power is given unto me, in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. <clears throat> so as I went through the points already, <clears throat> the uh, points are simple and straightforward, and they're flourishing here at Grace Bible. And I just bless God Almighty that these doctrines are flourishing. But by way of introduction, I want you to look at verse 17. There's a little second half of verse 17 brings to mind what these preachers heard right before they heard the commission. Their own doubts. Their own doubts. Why do believers doubt? To be grounded that you're a sinner and nothing more. You never be anything more than just a sinner. And when you're going out to preach, you're going out to preach to sinners. People just like you that doubt, that fear, that can't do anything right. Even after hearing the gospel, can't do anything right. <clears throat> but some doubted. What do you think they said? They said things like, is this really the true Christ? They saw him preach for years, resurrect dead people out of the grave. They saw Christ heal people saw his own body pierced, tormented, dead, put into a grave, and now alive. And they're sitting there saying, I'm not sure if this is the right one to worship. It doesn't get any clearer than that from a human standpoint. It does not get any clearer. I'm convinced this passage is here to show us, unless God give you grace to believe, you shall not believe. We are 100% full of doubt. Lest God give us to believe. In this doubt, I also hear, am I an elect? This Christ that died, was buried, resurrected, and is now alive in heaven. Did he do it for me? Am I an elect? That's not the question. That's not the question. It's, are you a sinner? By way of introduction, there's three verses here that we don't need to turn to. They're right there at the top of your outline. Jesus said, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ was sent, Matthew 15, 24, only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then Matthew 21, 31 says, Jesus tells the righteous who rejected John the Baptist, the publicans and the harlots, the, the, the sinners that are among you, they go into the kingdom of God before you. That didn't mean that you're going to go in last. That means you're never going in and they're going in and you're watching them go in. These sinners that went and listened to John the Baptist preach, harlots, prostitutes, that were given a new heart, a new mind to say this, he's talking about my Savior. I'm 100% sin and Christ is 100% righteous. I want to be baptized because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Not anything I've ever done. I'm just full of sin. Those are the people that went right down in the waters and went home and rested on Christ for the rest of their life. The self-righteous religious leaders of the time that said, those are just wicked people. Those are the off scour of the earth. I don't want anything. I don't want to be in that company. They died in their sin. And Jesus, before he gave the Great Commission, he gave some to doubt. He gave some to doubt to make sure in their mind, I'm 100% sin. That's what John the Baptist had to go through right before his death. Turn to Matthew 11. Two verses in Matthew 11 where John the Baptist, remember what John the Baptist was about to be beheaded? For standing up against immorality is <clears throat> a picture of hate for Christ to live or have sex outside of marriage. He spoke up vehemently against it and was going to be beheaded for it. And he went out and said, is, is this the one we should look to or is there another? And Christ said in verse 5 of Matthew 11, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. That poor is what John the Baptist had to hear about before he died. That's right, all I am is sin. And this Savior is righteous and holy. I'm poor. Verse 6, And blessed is he who's, whoso, whoever shall not be offended in me. Whoever's not offended in Christ, you're blessed. You're poor. 
You're a beggar. You're a sinner. You're not offended in the one that's 100% righteous. You think, well, no, I'm, I've got a piece of righteousness. You're offended in Christ. Because Christ says you're 100% nothing and he's 100% everything. Let's, let's look at Galatians 5 to see this, please. Turn to Galatians 5. <clears throat> Galatians 5 and verse 4 levels it down as about, about man's works, man's self-righteousness versus Christ being 100% righteous. Galatians 5 verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You're fallen from grace. You have nothing to do with grace. Grace is unearned favor. You think you're doing something to deserve favor? That's not grace. That's works. You're a fool. You're dead in your sin. For we... Through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Righteousness is by faith, the faith of Christ. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision, that's, that's works, availeth anything, or not circumcision. Whether you're an atheist or you're a real religious, zealous person, it means nothing to God Almighty. But faith is what matters, which worketh by love. What's he talking about love now? love of Christ, not self. You debase yourself. You think little of yourself. You think that you're only a sinner. That's a love towards Christ. In the, in the mind that's saved, there's no room for self-love. If you love Christ uh, and it's a racial love, you don't love him at all. It's 100% love for Christ. That's what faith is. 100% reliance on him for your salvation versus love for self. They can't be in the same mind at the same time. It's one or the other. You're either for God or you're for mammon, for yourself. There's no middle ground. Look at verse 11. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The author of this was saying, if I'm being persecuted, and boy, if you preach grace, 100% pure grace, 100% love for Christ alone, and deny yourself, people are going to hate you, hate your doctrines, hate your God. That's persecution because they don't want Christ to proclaim he solved it all. He accomplished salvation alone. He's 100% righteousness, and you can't add to that, and you can't take away from it. The world has no interest in this salvation of a 100% righteous Savior. They want their own self-righteousness to be a contribution to salvation. They want to have a credit or a stake in their salvation. That's robbery from God Almighty. God won't have that. He does not share His glory, His mercy with anybody. He gives it to whoever He will. His glory is that He picks who He saves from before the foundation of the world. You can't add to that and you can't take away from it. It's a free gift. <clears throat> but nothing added and nothing taken away is the key point. That is the offense of the cross. People think, well, he, he died for a particular people, and that's offensive. That is offensive to somebody outside of Christ. That's not what God's talking about when he says the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross is that it's finished. The work of salvation is complete in Christ alone. <clears throat> no more work for man. You can't contribute. So the purpose and the use of doubt is to be leveled in the fundamental principle that you're 100% sin. Now the Great Commission means something. Now the Great Commission is valuable. These points that Christ said, you better make these points when you preach. You don't make these points, it's ridiculous. You've got to proclaim man is 100% sin and Christ is 100% righteous. You think you're something? Here's some doubt. Now what do you think yourself? Yeah, nothing. That's where you should be when you preach the gospel. You're nothing and you're preaching to people that are nothing. And those are the good ones. Those are the ones that are elect before the foundation of the world. Those are the ones I want that all power is given unto Christ to know. I don't want the fools of the world that won't ever come to know Christ savingly, that are reprobate to come to know this. I'll even not even preach to them. I'll speak in parables so that they can't unravel it logically. They'll be all confused under gospel ministry because it just doesn't make sense. It's too confusing. This is God Almighty that has power and gives power to Christ alone to save who he wants. It's the point, first point of the Great Commission. The resurrection of Christ is declaration that he is all power and all might. Turn to Philippians 3, please. 
when Christ came up out of that grave, <laughs> it was an open declaration. There's nothing you can add to this. How is man going to go to hell and come back again and justify herself? How can you contribute to this salvation? You can't do one thing. Christ, he's all power. He's almighty. Philippians 3 and verse 4. <clears throat> Where did I turn to? Philippians 3. So this is the Apostle Paul writing about his state before salvation. Philippians 3, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I the more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. This is the Apostle Paul bragging about his background, religious background. The stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law, Pharisee, concerning the zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. You couldn't hold him to a legal battle on anything. Nobody had a charge against this man. But what things were gained to me, those I count for loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things, all these religious things is what he's talking about, a loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all these things. And I'm grateful is what he's saying. I count them, but dung, that I may win Christ, that I may win Christ. I want the top prize. In salvation, there's no second place. You're either in the resurrected Messiah or you're damned to hell. There's no middle ground. Be found in him is what matters. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, love towards Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. The Apostle Paul is convinced the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the declaration. This is the one that has all power. The, one, the only one that has power to save sinners. Paul, knowing I'm just sin, all I ever did religiously, the very best thing I did religiously is considered dumb. It's a bad thing before God Almighty because it shows I wasn't resting on Christ alone. I was looking to some work that I would contribute to salvation. This is to be in the gall of bitterness against God and to hate God Almighty and to be declared a doomed sinner. If you think you can contribute to salvation, you're lost in your sin right now. The second point of the Great Commission is also for sinners. Boy, sinners loved it in the New Testament times when the gospel was preached to all nations. Not just Jews. There was Gentiles that said, we'll hear this message again. You're preaching Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. This is authentic salvation. This is good stuff. And it's not just for the Jews. Sinners love this message in New Testament time, early New Testament times. They're just blown away by it. Don't turn to Romans 3, please. Romans 3 and verse 29 is where God says, Is God the God of the Jews only? He's asking. Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of course. Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Faith, faith is where it's at. Not whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether you're religious or an atheist. Those that come to authentic salvation have the same F in their life. Faith, to totally rely and rest on Christ. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. He, what he's saying is plainly, we look to the one that kept it. We look to Christ who kept this law. This law is holy. This law is righteous. This law is perfect. Can we do it? Not a bit of it. In Christ, I believe I've kept every bit of it because Christ kept it and charged it to his people. Charged that obedience to the elect. Verse Chapter 4 now. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Here's Abraham, our father, as, pertain, as pertained to the flesh. What, what hath he have found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. He's saying, if Abraham's in heaven right now, saying, I made it, 
I've got righteousness of my own. I contributed to my faith. I conjured up some belief and I got before God and I did something. God say, you're out of here. I won't have that. I will not share my glory with anybody, especially not Abraham. What's Abraham say then? Verse three, for what saith the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him, imputed or charged to him as righteousness. Any salvation that's authentic, the authentic salvation includes mercy and grace where God gives you to believe and rest on Christ alone as your Savior. Not just the Jews. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile or what you are. God will seek you out and save you His way and cause you to see that you're a sinner and be joyous that it's for all nations. All the different nations, all the different tongues, all the different kindreds of all the world, there's at least one elect in every one of us. Every one of them are going to be saved. And he's going to teach and preach baptism, point three. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, baptism includes all three. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Salvation is the same for everybody. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The key point here is it's according to the scriptures. Christ didn't make up his own path, his own way. God the Father prescribed how he would save his people from their sins, proclaimed it in prophecy, generation after generation. This is how the Messiah is going to look, talk, walk, these are the holy words that he's going to speak and keep perfectly, easily, because he's thrice holy God in human flesh. Then he came and accomplished it, declared it openly that he's the one to look to. And this has been delivered unto your ears. The obedience of Christ and his obedience to the Father in his life, death, burial, and resurrection, that's your salvation. That's your hope. This is the one to have faith in and a trust in and to rely on. This is the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection. Not yours. You have no contribution to salvation. You're the recipient of it. Christ is the one that worked out his death, burial, and resurrection. And that he charges to each one of his saints. <clears throat> and it comes to point number four. Christ observed all things. This is what we're to preach from the pulpit. That Christ is the obedient one. I shouldn't preach that you should go out and do this and do that to justify yourself. I should preach Christ is the obedient Messiah that accomplished salvation for his people. You should observe all things that he has satisfied the law's demand. Look to the one that did it. Under point four, turn to Matthew 3, please. Matthew 3. <clears throat> Again, for sinners... Sinners that are preaching to sinners that shall be saved is what this great commission is about this evening. God gives us to see that we're just sinners. Matthew chapter 3, and this is, happens to be the same verse that we're memorizing now in teaching time. Luke 3.16 is the same as Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he, that's Christ, that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in the hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Look at, look at Christ's authority and judgment upon his return. Those that are outside of him, the chaff, are going to burn in unquenchable fire. And those, the wheat, the very children of God the Father that Christ bought back with his holy blood, they're all going to be gathered into him, safe and secure. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, John, to be baptized of John the Baptist. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. This fulfilling all righteousness is his death, burial, and resurrection. This has been staged before the foundation of the world and carried out by Christ and John the Baptist to openly communicate to sinners, just sinners, 
You're self-righteous. You're wasting your time. This message is for sinners. Here is the Son of God the Father that was pushed down in that water, tormented, fearfully damaged and destroyed in your place, perished in your place, but brought up out of the earth, out of the grave, and declared as wholly righteous in and of himself. When this happened, what happened? Jesus was baptized. He went up straightway out of the water, verse 16. Lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and laying upon Christ and the voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one place at one time declaring, It's finished. This is the finished work that I declared before the foundation of the world that shall save my people from their sins. The work of salvation is complete in him. If you're a sinner and you can't complete salvation, it's done. The package is sealed and wrapped and handed to you. There's nothing for you to do. You're safe and secure in this Messiah. If you're a sinner, say, well, am I elect? No, I don't. Are you a sinner? Sinners. Sinners have God with them always. Last point of the Great Commission. Christ is with you always, even unto the end of the world. Turn to 1 Corinthians first chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Sinners need to know that Christ is with them always. Because we have a lot of problems. A lot of problems. We look more at ourselves, we just see more sin, more depravity, more problems. We look to Christ, there. We're all good again. We're all safe again. Christ is with you always. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. <laughs> the, the means by which God gives grace, honor and favor, is by His dear Son's death, burial, and resurrection. That in everything ye are enriched by Him. <laughs> made whole. What an enrichment. Made perfect again, made righteous again, charged goodness, given faith to believe it and trust on Him. In all utterance and in all knowledge, whatever you say, whatever you think that's godly and true and right about the Lord Jesus Christ's obedience and His goodness and His beauty, that is the Spirit of God within you saying it, thinking it, doing it. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See the earnest expectation of the saint? Boy, it's going to be great when he comes back. I can't wait till he's back on this earth and his enemies are tormented and his people, us sinners, are brought back together, eyeball to eyeball with Christ, safe and secure. Verse 8, Who shall also confirm you unto the end? that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the day of judgment, that horrible day for people that are outside of Christ, they'll be running, asking the mountains to fall on them. You'll be safe and secure going, what's the big deal? Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he lovely? Can I just kiss his feet? You'll be given a stable, sure mind that you are a sinner and he is perfect and righteous. This is the security that you have now. The use of the message is dear to me because when I first started hearing this gospel message, the Lord piecemealed just a little meal here and there. I'd hear for hours and then there's one more little piece that, yeah, that means something. And I'd hang on to the next little piece, the next little morsel. And that's, if anybody here is like me, you need this message. The use of the message is Philippians 1, six, being confident of this very thing, sinner, that God which have begun a good work in you, given you a little insight to the gospel, a little peace here about the preached message, a little knowledge that that's the right Messiah. This is the one I'll wait on. This is God's work. This is a good work that he's worked in you, and he's going to perform this until the day of Christ's return. If he's given you one morsel of grasping this gospel message, and you say, ah, there he is. There's more coming. There's no end to that. It's a deep well, a spring with inside you that he's put in there and it's going to come out more every time you hear the gospel message. More, more, and more, all the way until you see him upon his return. 
or your death out of this life. You say, he led and fed all the way. My life is just short and wicked and evil, but he led and fed me every bit of my life. May it be your rest on this Christ. It's my prayer for everybody here.